Hello, my name is Vizdevina Stankova. I'm a professor of mathematics at Mills College in UC Berkeley. Today we will talk about restricted patterns, a topic which I learned as an undergraduate many years ago, on which I did my first research and which stayed with me for the rest of my professional career. And I hope some of you will get so excited about this topic that you will solve in the near future some of the open questions you will hear about. I was introduced to the topic by Professor Joe Gallion, a former MAA president and the director of the Duluth Research Experience for undergraduates for almost 40 years. And even though I may look like this now, I actually looked like this in 1991, in 1992, when I returned to the program the next summer to solve the problems that I couldn't do the summer before. On the way from the airport to the dorms, Joe Gallen didn't waste any time. He asked me, what would you like to work on, combinatorics or graph theory? I knew nothing about graph theory and just a little bit about combinatorics. So after I said combinatorics, he didn't waste time again and directly gave me Julian West's PhD thesis from MIT in the van. He said, look at those two conjectures on Wilf equivalences of singleton permutations and see if you can prove them. Also, there is a nice result on the Schroeder numbers, but the proof is really long and winded. See if you can find a better, shorter one. Needless to say, I knew nothing about forbidden subsequences, these days called restricted patterns, or generating trees, so I had to physically go to the nearest physical library. You have to understand that in the 1990s, there were no laptops, no iPads, no cell phones, no internet. And so I walked quietly there the next morning and asked for all possible papers on the topic. And yet an exhaustive search at all of the sister libraries in Minnesota revealed only one recent source of information on restricted patterns, Julian West's thesis which I already had. And so I had to open it and read what was on the first page. The first page said that we will write from now on a permutation. What's a permutation? A sequence of the numbers from 1 to k in some order. And we will drop the commas if k happens to be less than 10 because this will cause no confusion. So if you know what the permutation is, Keep on listening. If you don't, stop the talk and research on the internet because you have the internet. Assuming you know what the permutation is, here is the formal definition of the basic concept that appears in this thesis and in the whole area of restricted patterns. It talks about what it means for one permutation to avoid another. And as you can see, very little insight can be gleaned out of this algebraic formulation. And it was almost enough to drain my enthusiasm in the topic. Fortunately, there was a visual interpretation of these concepts. So, if you have a permutation tau, in other words, the numbers from 1 to n arranged in some way in a row, we don't have to think of it as a sequence of numbers. We can think of it as dots in an n by n table. And that really is a very powerful visual image. Let's be more specific. Let's take the permutation 1, 3, 2. So these are the numbers from 1 to 3 arranged in some order. So what we do is we construct a 3 by 3 table and we write those numbers in their separate columns as they come, also putting them in relative height to their size. So one is put in row one, two in row two, and three in row three. Okay, so we have somehow encoded the permutation, and at this moment we realize that we don't need the actual numbers. We can just replace them with dots. So this becomes your backsplash, beautiful model for your kitchen. 
and vice versa. If you start with this style, you can reconstruct the original permutation very easily. But now, if you're a chess player, you will recognize what you're doing here. You're putting three rooks in a non-attacking configuration on a 3x3 three three board. And this works for any size permutation. As long as you don't put two rooks on the same row on the same column, you will have a permutation matrix. So the formal name, fancy name that mathematicians like to call this is transversal of a matrix. So at this moment, we have permutations as rows of numbers. That's not very insightful. But also as tiles, as tables, and by end tables, with dots put in non-attacking rook configurations. Raising the stakes now, from a permutation of length 3, we go to a permutation of length 8. This is an actual chessboard, 8 by 8. And we have the permutation 5, 2, 6, 8, 7, 4, 3, 1. Now that's the large permutation. I'm going to give you a smaller one, this squarish permutation, 3, 1, 4, 2. And I will ask you, does the big permutation avoid the small one? The answer here is no, because I can pick four dots in the original permutation. I can mark their rows and columns and I can gradually transform them into the smaller matrix without changing who is larger, who is smaller. So the answer here is no. The larger permutation does not avoid the smaller one because it contains a sub-pattern 5, 2, 7, 3, which is of the same type as the small one. Changing the players, well, keeping the first one, by changing the second one, this is the other square permutation, 2, 4, 1, 3. The same question, does the big permutation avoid the small one? And here you have to stare for a while to convince yourself that you cannot find this pattern here, which is not obvious, you have to convince yourself. So surprisingly, the answer is yes. The big permutation avoids the small one because it does not have any sub-pattern which is of the same type as the small permutation. So the main set of interests are S sub n of tau. Now this is a little bit of a complicated notation. So what it means is that you want to avoid the small permutation tau with big permutations of length m. So this bubble represents all permutations of length n that avoid tau. And everything outside contains tau. From our examples, this is the second example. If you want to avoid 2, 4, 1, 3, here is the set of permutations of length n that avoid it. Our big permutation pi is in this set because we couldn't find a sub-pattern 2, 4, 1, 3 inside here. However, the first example, if you want to avoid 3, 1, 4, 2, our permutation pi refuses to be inside here because it actually contains a sub-pattern of the same type as 3, 1, 4, 2. Okay, so moving on, every theory in mathematics has classic questions. The questions in this theory are in two patterns. One of them are calculate and the other one are classify. So I may ask you, if I give you permutation tau and you want to avoid it, how many permutations of length n are avoiding it? That's a calculating problem, a problem in enumerative combinatorics. The other type of question is about the restrictiveness of permutations and classifying them. So the main definition that comes along these questions is when two permutations are so-called Wilf equivalent or equally restrictive. So in other words, you take level 17 and you look for all permutations that avoid tau and then you look for all permutations of length 17 that avoid sigma. 
you count them and you get the same number. You change to 100, level 100 again, the number of permutations of length 100 that avoid one is equal to the number of permutations of length 100 that avoid the other one. In other words, it doesn't matter which one you're trying to avoid, it is equally easy or equally hard to avoid them. You're always going to get the same number of permutations avoiding them. So in this case, we say that the two permutations are Wilf equivalent after a famous combinatorist, Professor Wilf. And what mathematicians denote this by is by a very familiar symbol to you probably from similar triangles in geometry. So this is the symbol for Wilf equivalence. And mathematicians would ideally like to classify permutations up to Wilf equivalence. If you throw at me two permutations, I should be able to recognize are they equally restrictive or not. So that's what the classification is about. So I will show you the first non-trivial case of classification for S3. In other words, if I take all permutations of length 3, which of them are Wilf equivalent and which are not? By the way, for homework, do S2. It is very simple after you understand S3. So in S3, you can start with 3 to 1. That's a non-attacking group configuration of a 3 by 3 table. And you can also look at 1, 2, 3. Those two will be obviously Wolf equivalent. Why? Because if you have something large that avoids 3 to 1, what you can do is you can flip it and get something that avoids 1, 2, 3 and backwards. So whatever avoids 3, 2, 1, you can flip it and get something that avoids 1, 2, 3. So you will always be getting the same numbers on both sides. So those two by symmetry are Wilf equivalent. But we have four more permutations in S3. These are the so-called wedge permutations. These are the only other non-attacking group configurations that you can find. Why are they all Wilf equivalent? Because you can get from one to the other by applying symmetries. So from the first to the second one, you can flip along a horizontal line, from the second to the third along a vertical, and from the third to the fourth, you can rotate by 90 degrees clockwise. So all of those now must be Wilf equivalent. So we are getting two symmetry classes in S3. So what's the question? Are permutations from one and the other also Wilf equivalent? It looks extremely counterintuitive. If you're trying to avoid this pattern and this one, why should you get the same number of permutations? One should be more restrictive than the other. So at the request of Wilf, actually, Wilf equivalence was established not by one, not by two, but by several mathematicians using different methods. And I will show you one way to attain that, but we will first have to make the conclusion that if indeed this is so, we have only one Wilf equivalent class in S3. In other words, all permutations of length 3 are Wilf equivalent. Doesn't matter which one you are trying to avoid, it's all the same. You will get the same number of restrictions, you will get the same number of permutations. This in itself is indeed counterintuitive, but it is the truth. So in trying to answer the second question, or the other question about how many permutations avoid um, any one of those, we come across one of the most famous numbers in mathematics, Catalan numbers. Here they are. You're in a town and you can move only to the right and up. But you also have a river in the middle of the town. There are no bridges across. You cannot cross the river. In other words, you have to move only in this triangle. So your moves can be only to the right and up. How many paths can get you from the origin, let's say, to this point on the river, 4-4? Four, four. Here is one such path. We will call it a Catalan path. And so for homework, you can check 
that the first several Catalan numbers are C1 will be 1, C2, 2, and no, that's not the Fibonacci sequence because C3 is 5 and C4 is 14. In fact, you can find these days lots of information on the internet about the Catalan numbers and they are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of papers that involve them. You will find direct formulas, recursive formulas, and so on. And these famous numbers appear once again in our research of forbidden subsequences. If you want to avoid any one of those patterns, let's say 2, 3, 1, you will end up with the nth Catalan number. So it is the same as if you want to walk along our Catalan path. Now, how can one prove this? Well, Knuth, who is a famous computer scientist and mathematician, and who, for many of us, is known by creating LaTeX, in which modern math textbooks and math books are written, he has noticed the following, that to avoid 231 is the same as the set of stack sortable permutations. What does this mean? Here is a train coming and its wagons are labeled 3, 1, 2, 4. Well, they are not arranged from 1 to 4 and we want to arrange them. What do we have at our disposal? We have this stack where you can put wagon after wagon. This is not falling down. This is actually horizontal. And you cannot pull out a wagon which was stacked earlier. You have to free it. The other thing that you can't do is you can't take a wagon from here and put it back because you're moving against traffic. So can you sort this particular permutation here? The answer is yes. I can take this three and move it across. Nope, that's wrong because then it's going to block the one. So the first thing you're going to do with the three is go down, stack it. Move one across, move two across, hold four, come back with the three that is stacked, and then move four across. Knuth explained this phenomenon of how Catalan numbers appear in our theory of restricted patterns in the following way. He studied the permutations that avoid two, three, one, and he recognized that these are exactly the set of stack sortable permutations. What does this mean? So you have a train coming and it's Wagons are labeled 3, 1, 2, 4, and we would naturally want to label them 1, 2, 3, 4. What do we have at our disposal? We have a stack where we can put the wagons and take them one by one. Obviously, if a wagon has some other one stacked after it, it has to wait until it is free to move. The other thing we can't do is move a wagon backwards because that's against traffic. So what you can do with a particular wagon is you can lay it through or you can stack it and wait for it to move back, uh, to move forward. So can we sort this guy? First, we can stack three, then we can move one and we can move two. Four will wait, three will come out and then four will go through. So yes, we can sort this guy, no problem. But can we sort this one? 3, 1, 4, 2. And the answer is no. Let us try. First, we have to stack 3. Then we have to let 1 go. 4 has to be stacked because 2 is coming. But then 3 is buried dead underneath that 4. You cannot free the 3. So what happened? What was the abstraction that did not allow us to sort this one, but allowed us to sort the previous one? There is only one possible abstraction. It is the sequence 2, 3, 1, which is contained right here. 3, 4, 2 is a subsequence of the same pattern, of the same type. And if you don't avoid this one, you won't be stack sortable. So Knuth noticed this and he said, okay, we like zeros and ones in computer science. 
So every attempt to stack a permutation can be written in terms of zeros and ones. If you put a wagon into the stack, you write a zero. If you take it out of the stack, you write a one. Even those wagons that you can carry straight across, you can still write them as a zero and a one. So you will end up with two n symbols, n zeros and n ones. And there is one rule. You can never have at any moment more ones than zeros. Why? Because you can never take out of the stack more wagons than you, had, you have put in. That same restriction applies to the Catalan paths. Moving to the right, you can call it a one, uh, a zero. M going up, you can call it a one. So you again end up with a binary string with a sequence of zeros and ones. But there is one restriction. At any moment, you cannot have more ones than zeros, because if you did, you'd be across the river on the other side. So in this very roundabout but beautiful way, we establish the sameness, the equivalence of several different objects that come from different areas of mathematics and computer science. Stack sortable permutations, avoiding 231, Catalan paths, and also we solve one of the problems in classifying S3. And so now let us look at S4. It turns out that S4 has seven symmetry classes. I'm showing you just representatives of them. So all of those seven tables represent one symmetry class. And they are grouped after a couple of decades, actually, of work, of research, into three Wilf classes. You can see one contains this diamond shape pattern. Another one is very interesting one. It is telling you that this quadrilateral pattern, which has no symmetries, is Wilf equivalent to this most symmetrical pattern, the square. So whether you want to avoid the square or you want to avoid this quadrilateral, you're going to get the same number of permutations. This is another paradox almost in the theory. And I proved this in Duluth using something called a tree isomorphism. But even to this day, I don't have a good idea of why this is happening and a better intuitive explanation of why these two patterns that are at the ends of the spectrum of symmetry are actually Wilf equivalent. So you may ask, what are the applications of forbidding patterns of larger and larger length? We saw some applications of forbidding patterns of length three. The Catalan numbers, for example, popped up. But of length four, I'm going to show you a few. Suppose you want to avoid this nice rectangular pattern, 2143. It turns out that this already appeared in research in a completely different area of mathematics in the 80s in something called auxiliary permutations. Ah, too theoretical for you. Let me show something more practical. Suppose in addition to this permutation, simultaneously you want to avoid the square one and three to one. Simultaneously. I don't want to have any of those patterns in my permutations. Who would care about this? Well, if you go to a casino to play cards, you might care a lot about those permutations. Because how do they shuffle the cards? Suppose you have a deck of 52 cards that are arranged in order. So what do you do? You split them in two stacks, approximately equal. There is an error there, but they could be equal or not equal. And then you start putting one card from one pile in between two cards of the other pile, right? And you do this, and you are not perfectly ideal, but in the end, you put them together, you open up, and you end up with a permutation of the original arrangement. Well, guess what? Those permutations are exactly the ones that avoid these three small permutations. So the so-called riffle shuffle permutations if you want to be a good player in casinos and you want to learn some mathematics along, along the way, you'd better study 
avoiding these three permutations simultaneously. Here is another example. You want to avoid this nice rectangular pattern and this diamond shape. It turns out this has been done in the 1990s uh, when studying something called Schubert varieties in algebraic geometry. So things from other areas of mathematics or from playing cards in casino or from arranging wagons all pop up to give us problems that are phrased in avoiding permutations. And here is my favorite one. Suppose you want to avoid those two squares simultaneously. You don't want to have either of them in your big permutation. Can you calculate this? Can you make sense of it? Does it represent something in real life? The answer is yes. Surprisingly, these are the so-called Schroeder numbers, which are very similar to the Catalan numbers, except the paths allow not just to the right and up, but also the small diagonals. So the Schroeder numbers are obviously larger than the Catalan numbers because you have more paths, but they count exactly those permutations that avoid both squares. And so a question to you, can you take pairs of permutations of length four, try to avoid them and interpret what you're going to get in real life? That is, of course, a question of a very, very large magnitude, and it hasn't been answered nearly as much as we can. Applications beyond S4. Well, here we, you think we're going to get into an area of uh, basically science fiction. How can larger patterns really appear in reality or anywhere? Well, guess what? I was asked to solve this question. I was given four patterns of length eight and three to one. Avoid all of them simultaneously and please tell me how much you get. I look at this like, who could even care about such a avoiding question? Why these permutations? Why all of them together? It turns out that two mathematicians at MIT, Billy and Warrington, were working on a completely independent problem when they found out that their objects that they were studying were in one-to-one -one correspondence with precisely avoiding those five permutations. And they gave them a name, the three-to-one hexagon avoiding. I wanted a visual. So here is a visual. Here are the four long permutations. They all share a common core, a rectangle, and the remainders are just small perturbations of each other. You want to avoid all of them. You can put them all on the same table. This is not going to be any more non-attacking group configuration, but it is a configuration that you are trying to avoid. So when you add three to one to it, let us call this number alpha sub n. In other words, the number of permutations of length n that avoid both of those are alpha n. So what I was asked in 2001 was to give an approximation of those numbers because the researchers did not know how many objects they were looking at. They did not know how they grew, whether exponentially or whether by some other laws. They did not know if there were any such objects after a while. And so we set out to find out if there was a formula for alpha sub n and what we could do with this question. Not only we gave them an approximation, but we gave them an exact formula. And for those of you who know recursive sequences, this is a sequence of order six with not only constant coefficients, but actually integer coefficients. And any of you who have worked with such recursive sequences knows that anything is possible from now on. You end up with a polynomial of degree six, you find its roots, some of which are going to be complex numbers here, but then you will have an exact formula and you can get correct calculations for any n, precise calculation. And so mathematicians, when they saw this, they constructed a machine, an algorithm, 
where if you have some permutation or family of permutations in mind, you can feed to this machine and the machine will be able to either spit out a recursive sequence or, or say there isn't a recursive sequence up to a certain order. So now we move to classifying S5. It turns out that the classification of S5 was already miraculously completed by what was done for S4. And I will show you all of the Wilf classes. Here they are. There are 16 Wilf classes. Let's look at them closely. These four I'm going to call indecomposable because the others are decomposable. All of the other permutations can be split into two blocks of smaller permutations that are lined up along the diagonal and glued at the edge. So in other words, these decomposable ones can be studied by looking at smaller permutations. But those here, you can't do this. You cannot split them into their atoms. This is an atom, what you see there. So it turns out that this is it for S5. Um, the Wilf classes are. For S6, there was only one pair of permutations that avoided classifications for over 10 years. And that pair, when viewed from the right angle, looks like this. Both permutations are decomposable. The bottom ones are the same. And the top ones are flips of each other along the diagonal. And West, Julian West and I proved the theorem that settled this final case in S6. And then a long, several month computer calculation happened before we could say that luckily we have done it for S7 and S8. The theorems that were proven by many people were enough, strong enough to classify S7 and S8. It took several months to confirm this, that there is nothing else out there that was missed. Where is S9? No one knows. Perhaps by now the computers are fast enough and the people are smart enough to make algorithms and check if S9 has already been classified or if there are some pairs of mysterious permutations that might be Wilf equivalent. What now? We have classified up to Wilf equivalence everything we could, and now mathematicians turn to another question, Wilf ordering. If you know the two permutations are Wilf equivalent, okay, they're equally restrictive. No questions asked. But what if they are not Wilf equivalent? What does it mean? Is one of them more restrictive than the other? So that's how this definition of Wilf ordering came about. We say that one permutation is less restrictive than another if there are more things that avoid it than the other permutation, at least for n large enough. Mathematicians will recognize this as asymptotic ordering, not just absolute ordering. So in 97, a Hungarian mathematician, Bonner, working in Florida, showed the Wilf ordering on S4, that precisely these permutations were arranged like that. So the least restrictive one was the diamond. The next one was the so-called identity permutation. And the most restrictive was our irregular quadrilateral. This was based on extensive computations which to this day are not satisfying to me because they don't, again, give me an idea of why this is so. And now to the open questions, the truly open questions of the field. We have classified up to Wilf equivalence S3 through S8. We have classified up to Wilf ordering only S4. There is nothing to talk about in S3 because everything is Wilf equivalent. Can we order S5? After extensive computer calculations, I have conjectured this ordering. As you can see, this is a flashback from the classification of S5 with the 16 Wilf classes. And there are these inequalities between them, 15 of them, 14 of them are marked with questions. There is only one proven. 
So 14 conjectures here about ordering. What does this picture mean? If this indeed is true, and this is the Wilf ordering of S5, it means that in decomposable permutations are more restrictive than decomposable ones. So in other words, very few permutations, for example, avoid this pattern. This is the hardest pattern to avoid, the square with the dot inside. This is amazing. Why should that be so? At the other end of the spectrum, why isn't the identity permutation the least restrictive? It makes sense, right? It is the one furthest away from the indecomposable one. It is fully decomposable. And yet, it is beaten by two other permutations, these fish-like looking permutations, which are also decomposable, but they're not the identity permutations. Why? Again, we have only one theorem and 14 more to go. And an explanation that should unify this theory and give us deeper understanding of what is going on. So from an obscure topic from the early 1990s, where only a few people knew about restricted patterns, where the library had only one reference to them, Julian West thesis, this area of mathematics has grown so large that there are every year international conferences on permutation patterns. Over the years, they have changed countries, including US in many of those years. So if you are really excited about this topic, you want to learn the real truth and all of the open questions, and there are many more out there than I managed to tell you, please check the schedule and attend the conference. I dedicate this talk to Joe Gallion, the fifth Beatle. Thank you very much. <laughs>